I want to bring in now Mario Gabelli, a friend of our show, as you know, uh, Mario Gabelli is the founder and also the CEO of Gamco Investors. And we always like to say this, Institutional Investors Money Manager of the Year named uh, this year. And Mario, you own, I think, about, uh, or your funds own about 900,000 shares of Yahoo. So what is the best way to extract value out of this company? Well, you go back to where Microsoft did put their arms around this company and they thought the price was too low at $36. Train wreck. I mean, take two and uh, telephone and data systems. A lot of managements have damaged shareholder values by being ornery, stubborn, or mindful of their own jobs. The numbers are compelling. The stock's 1360, you know, 18 to 22, but materially lower than they had a couple of years ago. So what happens? And clearly, uh, if I was the Chinese government in Beijing, I would go to Jack Ma and say, hey, listen, you're hurting all of the companies, hurting the reputation of all investors in Chinese securities by what you did, and that is your land grab. So that's work in progress. What do you mean by that? What do you mean that you're well, hurting all Chinese investors by the land? What do you mean by that? Well, what Jack Ma did, what Jack Ma did was to say, hey, I have to have 100% control of Alipay and right. just basically took it with no compensation, and then they've been negotiating for yes. some kind of compensation. The most recent deal was X and Y and Z, and uh, anyone can look that up, uh, what the details are. So if I were the Chinese government and I'm saying, listen, I want to attract investors back to China, let's correct this. Let's show corporate governance. You know, Sino Forest, a whole oh, bunch see. of these companies, okay. uh, uh, integration into uh, uh, going public by uh, buying into an American shell. All of those elements have kind of pinged but, 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 but China aside, though, I mean, the best way to extract value out of Yahoo is what? To break it up? To sell it off as a whole? Oh, I can't answer that. I'm not going to say that we're an expert on that. Clearly, the sum but of the parts... you look at that when you own the Yeah, stock, well, the sum though. of the parts gives you a margin of safety, okay? And if we were running Yahoo, we'd find a way to take an exchange of the Japanese holdings on a tax-deferred basis. And the guy that can do that on the back of an envelope is in Denver. John Malone could figure that out. So they, their first call should be to, John, help me figure out how to put the, uh, and extract value here. Really? Why not? A telephone and data system should do the same thing. And uh, Mario, just before the break, we were talking, of course, about the firing of, of uh, CEO Carol Bartz and just overall, um, you know, how to value companies and what CEOs are looking at. So let me just ask you more broadly, the CEO of this country, right, President Obama, everybody waiting for what he's going to say in this job speech. We know a lot of the details, but what is going to be critical that he gets across tonight? <laughs> I don't know if he's going to be able to pull it off. He's going to be too political, too partisan, and basically what you need is confidence and reunite the country in terms of a vision for the future. Clearly, he'll talk about jobs, which is his job two years ago. Will he do tax reform? Will he suspend regulations that are kind of onerous and killing jobs? Will he that, focus well, on education? Regulations won't be a part of, of what we're talking about tonight. Well, you've got, to, you've got to inspire confidence in business. And you've, so I would do a tax cut for the corporations. I would try to put tax reform down, education, infrastructure, housing. You've got to focus on housing because you want to start clearing the market. You want to get money to spend. And then energy independence. And so if I were the, looking at it from the point of view of appointing a CEO, that's what I'd like to hear. Or he goes the way of Carol Bartz. Mm, and gets fired. Well, it doesn't get reelected. I mean, you know, the, here right, we have course. voters every day. Unfortunately, the individuals that spoke last night, kind of a Tower of Babel. Let and me ask you this. That you raise an interesting question. If Obama was not to get reelected, I know we're talking, a, you know, a year and a half out. If he was not to get reelected, would that actually create a market rally? Would that? No, I'm serious. <laughs> if the, I'm serious. If, if the market collapses between now and then, clearly uh, that would be of, of interest. Uh, but that, that is not something that we think about at the moment. Look, in 2012, you have a new president in Russia. Uh, that sounds like somebody with the letter P, Putin. Uh, you know, you have an ongoing dynamics in major countries around the world, including China. Right. The new uh, ni uh, fi the ninth time, uh, uh, five-year plan is coming. They've got management succession there. So this has changed. Now, we have change in places like Libya and uh, Egypt. Uh, that take a, a, a hostile turn. Hopefully here we do it at the ballot box and not on the streets. Mario, last time you were on, I think you said we were at a tipping point, right? We need to get that confidence back in the markets. It's not happening yet. We haven't gotten it yet from the jobs report. We don't have it yet from, from Bernanke. What do you think is going to, what is going to tip us back towards more positive growth versus what people are talking about, which is a double dip? 
there's no question that we've raised the uh, percentage probability of a, another recession, of China not getting their act together, of Europe imploding. But the question then is confidence, and that could be changed. What happened in the middle of July is that consumer, the investor, and business just said, ouch. Right. Hey, Mario, I see you're shaking your well, head. Well, basically, if I were in Europe and I'm Triche, my legacy is the Weimar Republic when inflation exploded in the, 30, in the 20s. If I'm Bernanke, I look at the Great Depression. Triche is lame duck. He's leaving in 60 days or less, and uh, Mario Draghi is taking over, so right. pass the buck. And that was totally expected. What he'll say is an interesting dynamic, but that was, uh, to from our point of view, leaving rates unchanged was legacy Triche. G7, get all the central bankers together and come up with a program of coordinating what's going to happen to interest rates, liquidity, and so on, is another dynamic. And, uh, you know, going to uh, Bernanke, the Federal Open Market Committee meeting uh, notes of uh, uh, August 9th basically laid out, laid out some of the options that they were discussing. Right, that they're going to do. Uh, uh, among others, and maybe they'll do something else. Do you think they'll do something? Are you expecting that they're going to do something? You're not going to have a two-day meeting without some dynamic. Okay, Evans gave you a little tip-off yesterday about what he was thinking of. There are other people that will give you uh, hints. But fiscal and monetary policy have to work hand in hand. They'll clearly get some dynamics from tonight. And unfortunately, it will be a political speech and not a vision of the future for America. Back to basics, how we made this country great, how we create entrepreneurialism, how do we uh, allow uh, innovation and ideas to surface. But do you think that that's what's holding back CEOs from hiring? There's a whole bunch of things. We went from the middle of June, where there was confidence, to the end of July, where CEOs were saying, are we going to have a recession? Everyone was talking about that. You have to listen to the the total blurry vision. How do we clarify that vision? How to have a vision 2020 as opposed to that blurry vision that was created in the last uh, uh, four or six weeks ago? Right. And I don't have any anecdotes for that or antidotes for that. But there's a whole bunch it's of things. It's just a general, a general sense that you're getting from the CEOs you're talking. There's to. no question, no question. Now some companies continue to see bright skies, and today we're having a conference, for example, in vendors to Boeing. The Dreamliner is finally flying. Airbus right. is cranking up production. So if you're selling widgets. To Boeing and Airbus, you're doing quite well, and your future is getting brighter every day. So yesterday, for example, two stocks hit an all-time high, selling auto parts, AutoZone and O'Reilly's. Mm. And so, you know, uh, and there's one that sells candles, so I'll light your candle. To Brian Moynihan and the crisis control that he's doing at B of A. It is the subject of the new cover story of Bloomberg Business Week. Moynihan's run at B of A started out well enough. The bank reported $3.2 billion in profit his first quarter at the helm. Since then, he's hit backlash from the housing crisis and the bank's involvement in home mortgages and mortgage-backed securities. The stock is now down more than 43% so far this year. Moynihan's latest push to regain control uh, of his bank included a massive management shakeup that we saw firing high-profile employee Sally Krawcheck and promoting two employees into the newly created roles of co-COOs. Bloomberg News' Don Capecchi had an exclusive interview with Moynihan just hours before he made those changes. Yes. Don, did he give you any clue at all that this was going to happen? Well, he talked about downsizing the company. He talked about streamlining it. It's part of the new Bank of the new BAC Bank of America plan, and he wants the the company to be smaller. He wants it to be focused. Right now, the company has 2.3 trillion dollars in assets. He said he'd be perfectly happy if it had 1.8 trillion dollars in assets, but was more efficient and was doing what it does better. So he did talk about about downsizing the company. He did talk about more layoffs to come, but he didn't hint at the management shakeup at the top, right. although he did say a re reorganization was in order. Did you call him back, by the way, right after that news came out? You know, yeah, yeah, <laughs> we're talking to them again. But yeah, okay. there's, there's, there's more changes to come. This company's obviously at a critical point. It's at a critical juncture. And what Moynihan does over the next few months will dictate the future of this bank Right. And his tenure, because he's an unproven CEO, yep. and and so far, you know, he's had a rocky start of it. He didn't he didn't cause this mess, but he inherited quite a mess, and and you know, people are still judging him on how effective he is in turning around the company. Right. If you look at the stock, you wouldn't think he's done anything no. with it. Yes. No, not yeah. at all. He hasn't created that value. Yeah, no. Mario, you own Bank of America shares. What do you think of the shares? We own a tiny amount, but uh, clearly we applaud Buffett for being so opportunistic. And from my point of view, mm -hmm. you know, 
housing will turn, housing will help, but also regulation like Dodd-Frank is not. And that is a challenge. And if I'm running a small business, I need cash, I need cash flow, I need uh, confidence, and to the degree that Bank of America is going to lend me money. Now, we went public through Merrill Lynch, so we have a great fondness for the Merrill Lynch organization. We, we do. <laughs> we do. We, we do. That umbilical cord would. And the other company that took us public was Smith Barney, and that's now part of uh, Morgan Stanley. So, so, when did you buy Bank of America stock? What was it at then? We don't own a tiny, you know, we have a it's large small organization. No, it's tiny. What we're buying is Bank of New York, we're buying Northern Trust, okay, mm -hmm. and we're buying the money managers and we're buying credit card processors. Okay, so it's not a favorite in your portfolio. Uh, it's not even on our radar screen, it just happens to be there. I think if we have five or ten million dollars, uh, okay, uh, or twenty million dollars worth of stock, I have much more in Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, okay, let me just talk because, Mary, you mentioned about you know the, the housing. Uh, you know, housing for Bank of America, mm -hmm. you know, obviously the, the loans that it makes to the housing sector, um, you know, which has been one of the problems, uh, you know, for the bank. And I know you well, talked about Well, Ken Lewis bought Countrywide, and that's one of the inherited yeah. legacy items, and uh, all of the pounding of, of the banks recently. But, uh, okay, okay. Uh, well, the top, okay, because she talked with the top legal counsel, okay? Mm -hmm. And what they did was they identified three, they called it buckets, right? Yes. Of um, problems here that are facing the bank from the housing sector. Of one litigation, is, yeah. Right, one is the reps and warranties that we've, uh, we've actually talked about quite a bit on yeah. the show. Yes. Um, um, that bucket has cost B of A eight and a half billion dollars if the settlement, if the settlement is even approved. survives. Yes. yes. Uh, the and next it will likely cost it a lot more than that. More than eight yes. and a half billion. Yeah. Okay. So then there's also the fraud loose, uh, lawsuits from investors, the AIGs, AIGs of the world. Uh, yes. Telling you that it was ten, you know, AIG seeking ten billion, but it obviously it could be much more than that. Yeah. Uh, this last bucket is these government allegations, the attorneys general, a uh, state suing the bank, the foreclosure, uh, the foreclosure fraud, or et the foreclosure yeah, fraud, yeah. exactly, the robo signings. Um, that price tag, uh, around twenty billion dollars. So you yes. add it all up. And no wonder then Moynihan has had a hard time trying to turn the stock around. Yes, they have. Uh, they have about 18 billion dollars in reserves to cover these costs. And if you look at the 18 billion up against that 30, 40 billion right there, they don't have enough reserves. So it's going to have to dip into capital. That's why investors are worried. That's why people are selling off the stock because there's so much uncertainty. And what Bank of America is trying to do is settle these cases to remove that uncertainty, take that off the table, and give investors something so they can look at their their earnings and know that those are real numbers. They don't know that their projected earnings are real numbers right now because they don't know who else is going to sue the bank and how much it's going to cost. Mario, what do you make of these? Uh, you know, I mean, this is obviously a hangover for yes. Bank of America. I have nothing you to add. You look this in. No, no, no. But I mean, it, it's hard to value a bank like this, right? When it's got these legal challenges, is it not? Yes. As My investor. core competency is doing what I do best, and I'm a specialist in certain areas. For example, yesterday I spent hours with the management of Beam Inc., James Beam. There, it's easy, clear sky. We focus on that. Rolls Royce. We spent a couple hours with them. We've been following the company for a long time. We have a major dynamic we don't spend a lot of time on the banks I don't so because they're too complicated no uh, well I started in the 1960s and the banks screwed up <laughs> over the Latin American loans but charter bank loans every five or ten years is an issue so we have not developed the core companies nor do we intend to okay. but we do like money managers I think we understand that business we right. do like credit card processors we like that like mobile pay wonderful business All right.